When you sit down to meditate, there are three things that you have to, to check, to survey, to make sure they stay together. There's the body, the feelings, and there's the mind. But the body, of course, we're mainly concerned with the breath. The mind is your awareness right here. We're trying to create a feeling of pleasure as a kind of glue to keep the mind with the body. If, as you survey these things, you find that one of them is off, then you make corrections, make adjustments. If there's something wrong with the breath, well, you can change the breath. Try deeper breathing, shallower breathing, heavy, light, fast, slow. See what kind of breathing feels good right now. You're not confined to whatever the body is doing, because the breath actually is called the bodily fabrication, and there's an intentional element in the breath. We can let the breath go on automatic pilot, but there's something in the mind that monitors it. So you want to take advantage of that fact. At the same time, the mind is something that you can fabricate as well, through your perceptions, through your feelings. So if the problem is the mind, you make adjustments there. The Buddha talks about this in several places. In one place he says, you try to get the mind to stay with the body, stay with the breath, say. And there's either a fever in the body or a fever in the mind. In other words, it's just not comfortable. You're not getting the feeling you need to glue these things together. You drop the breath, and you focus on an inspiring theme. In his breath meditation instructions, he says a similar thing. You, first you get sensitive to the state of the mind, and then you find if you need to gladden it, that's what you do. Give it something that feels uplifting. This is especially necessary now, where the news of the pandemic, the news of people's reaction to the pandemic can get pretty down. If all you're feeding on is the news out there, you're going to make yourself sick. You've got to take your own mind in hand and figure out what will give rise to a sense of well-being. This is not a Pollyannish pretending that everything is okay technique. It's a very clear-eyed realization that when things are down in the world, it doesn't help to get your mind down. You've got to lift it up. The Buddha lists many different themes for contemplation. One of them is recollection of the Buddha himself. Think about the fact that despite how the world is going right now, we are living in a world that has had a Buddha, and his teachings are still here. He sets a good example for human beings, that it is possible to find true happiness by being truly good. And he taught many people to do that. When we live in a world where people are looking for happiness and their ideas of goodness are very strange or they don't care at all, it's good to remember that there are people who said that the real deal, real happiness, requires that the mind be good, the heart be good. And there's something very nourishing in that thought. Look at the Buddha's example. He was born into wealth and power, and he abandoned them. He said that that wasn't the way to true happiness. He fact sacrificed a lot of his own personal comfort went through six years of austerities before he realized that that was a false path. 
But he kept trying. Nothing could discourage him. He was determined that if there was a path to the deathless, he was going to find it. And he did. And then he taught it for free. He walked all over northern India, wherever he sensed that there was somebody who would be ready to hear the teaching, he would go. And although not many people act like the Buddha, there are many people in the course of history who have been inspired by him. And you have every right to join that group of people. Those are the people who bring light to the human race. And you can be one of them. Because when we reflect on the Buddha, it's not simply admiring a person in the past or worshiping a person in the past or simply believing that there was such a person. He said, you're always going to have doubts until you found the Dharma within. And he pointed out how to do it. He didn't ask that you simply just believe, believe, believe. He said, we all come with uncertainty. And where are you going to cure the problem of uncertainty? Well, you can cure it by looking into your own mind and asking the right questions. In other words, you come to confirm your conviction not by stifling your doubts, but by directing them in the right way. As you said, you look into the mind and see what's dark and what's bright in the mind, what's skillful and what's unskillful. In other words, what mental states, when you act on them, lead to happiness? Those are the skillful ones. And what mental states, when you act on them, lead to the opposite? Those are the unskillful ones. This is something you can observe for yourself. Just take the time to make that question an important question in your mind. And look very carefully. This is one of the reasons why we practice meditation, is to get the mind so it can be mindful and alert enough so it can gauge what's going on in the mind. Exercise its powers of judgment in a really useful way. And you find as you develop the skillful qualities in the mind that they really are in line with what the Buddha taught. You develop concentration, you develop discernment. And that takes you to the point where you can confirm for yourself inside that the Buddha knew what he was talking about. There is a deathless and can be attained through human effort. That's how you overcome your doubts about the Buddha. From that point on, they say your conviction is confirmed. So he wasn't the type of teacher who would simply demand allegiance or demand belief. He said, exercise your doubts, but learn how to manage your doubts in a useful direction. It's refreshing that there are there is a teacher like that in the world, has been a teacher like that in the world, and that there are people who've carried on that tradition. And we can be among those. You take refuge in the Buddha in terms of his example, and you let that lift your mind up. That even though there are miserable people in the world, and by that I mean people acting in miserable ways, not all human beings are like that. There are human beings who have been shining examples, and you can take them as an example, and you will benefit. Because that was one of the Buddhist discoveries, is that by being good, in other words, developing really skillful qualities in the mind, qualities that are harmless, qualities that strengthen the mind in a good direction, you can find true happiness. And it's not the happiness simply of patting yourself on the back that you are good, 
but you open up to a dimension that's totally other, totally free from suffering. So we respect the Buddha because he teaches us to respect something in ourselves, our desire for true happiness, that desire that the world says, oh, don't bother. It's impossible. Nobody can do it. He's there to say, it is possible, and you can do it. And we also respect him because he treats us like adults. He doesn't simply demand allegiance. He has us exercise the full range of our mental abilities. So we have the opportunity to practice in line with his teachings. We live in a world, as I said, where his teachings are still alive. And at the moment we're still breathing. We're still capable of following those teachings. So let that thought be uplifting. The Buddha says that when you think of death, don't just think of the things you're going to miss. Think of the fact that, well, I do have this breath right now. There's a lot that I can do that would give meaning to this life. One instant, the Buddha said, of insight is worth more than a hundred years of no insight. So if all you have is one instant, okay, make sure it's the best thing you can do. So even though we admit that the world is often a discouraging place to look at, it doesn't have to be discouraging to our goodness. It doesn't have to discourage us when we say, well, maybe I only have a little bit of time left. Well, a little bit of time can be well spent. And the goodness you do in that little bit of time doesn't vanish. It lasts. So these are some of the things you can think about when you think about the Buddha. Not only who he was, but also how you can follow his example. And the, kind, and the way in which he would follow, have you follow his example. He treats you like an adult. He gives you a challenge. It's a good challenge, and it's a challenge that when you try to meet the challenge, you find it really makes life worthwhile. And with those thoughts in mind, then you can get back to the breath and develop those qualities, the qualities that the Buddha developed himself, and that he didn't lay exclusive claims to. He opened the path to everybody. So here it is, open to you. And let these thoughts be uplifting.